in part four, you join us just after the fallen tree bypass. The man in front is set off about 30 seconds ahead of me. Having had a few minutes to recover, I'm up for the next stretch of the route. Although the forest track is narrower, the surface is now a little less challenging. Straighter track and a better visibility allow me to keep a higher average speed. Catch up to Richard, who as always is patiently waiting at a junction. The bike feels a little strange as we pull away, and I just give it a bit of a wiggle to see if the feeling has any greater impact on handling. But it feels solid enough, and settles down on this short section of road. see in this shot the camera cages come loose again. Heads up, we're about to pass our turn off. There it is on the right, no wonder we missed it. No harm done though, the turnaround is swift enough. This is where the camera cage leaves us, which is why I usually secure them with a security cord. I'll give Richard a few seconds to get ahead before I set off after it. Oh, and the squiggly track lines are back, so I wonder what's in front of us. say the track is starting to narrow again. One of the things I'm not considered before riding the tent was the amount of concentration and energy it takes to plan and adjust your riding ride on the trail. Picking the riding line that offers the more solid ground with the least obstacles will benefit your journey and probably avert those punctures too. A continual assessment of near, middle and long distance terrain and obstacles together with the tech route on your navigation device takes some getting used to. For me, I assess the ground head as follows. Tech route match the plot with a long distance trail ahead, considering the visible obstacles. Middle distance is the area I will use to get into the correct line to achieve the long distance direction. Near distance, adapt my bike and rider positions 
to approach noted middle distance objects that are now within two meters of my front wheel. Concentrating only on the near ground may lead to difficulties in changing your riding line, or maybe even a fall, particularly if you pick the wrong gully to follow. So far so good, and the track has widened out. Following another rider can certainly remove some of the work out. I can see the effect of the man in front's chosen line by the movement of his bike. The fact he's out in front also confirms a long distance route when he's visible. Additionally, his tracks in soft ground give a hint to the line he took, and if he's not in a big heap on the road, that line was probably okay. We start climbing again and the squiggly line effect soon shows itself and the going gets harder. Here I switch sides to avoid the gully until the trail is too narrow and I have to take the central line. Climb is steep and getting narrower with headroom limitations too. Peer into the gloom, trying to plan my riding line, I get a dark foreboding that occasionally consumes me when I'm out riding with a man in front, and I get into a place I'd rather not be. My hands are starting to cramp, and a short breather is in order before attempting to move on. see the track of Richard's riding line on the ground in front of me. What I can see ahead, I know the next section may be beyond me at this point, and it's not long before Richard confirms it. Just three kilometres after our restart, this section is beyond me. Despite his suggestion to turn around, he agrees to ride my bike through, while I, of course, take the tough 10 minute stroll to catch him up. If you've not seen it yet, check out AJP PR7 vs. Tet France to see Richard riding my bike out of here. 
Then, catch us in the last of this series, part 5, Where Did the Road Go? Thanks for watching.